Welcome to our live stream. I'm here today with art prof teaching artist Kat Huang. And today we are doing a deep dive into Kat's artistic development and her current studio practice today. If you would like to grow as an artist and you can't afford an art class, we've got everything you need here at Art Prof, critiques and tutorials. All right, we're going to start at the very beginning, as you guys know, Art Prof baby photos. So Kat, when you were a kid, when did you show some artistic promise? I mean, I've asked my parents this before and they can't really remember. They've always <laughs> said that I've showed artistic prowess in some way or form. I've always liked images. I've always liked creating images. And also they forced me to play piano when I was little. <laughs> so I was really inundated by art. But yeah, I think my parents also wanted to encourage me to do other things as well. Actually, when I was looking for baby pictures of myself, I found a video my mom took where she's asking me, she's like, Catherine, what do you like to do? And I was like, I love drawing. And then my mom's like, okay, what else do you like to do? And I'm like, I like playing piano. And then apparently that's still not the right answer. My mom's like, okay, cool. Now what else do you like to do? And I was like, math? <laughs> and she's like, yes, good girl. <laughs> So where do these digital pieces come into play? Because you've been doing digital painting for a long time. I mean, didn't you grow up with digital art? Sort of. So towards, I don't know, when I was like eight, nine or 10, around later elementary school, I remember that my father got Photoshop CS3. I don't know. I think it was CS3. But and that was when my digital art, digital art really took off. But before that, if actually you go back, there is a she monster drawing that I did. And that was actually done through like AIM messaging because I was messaging my father at work and there was an option to open up a drawing section. And I drew this for my father while he was at work and he liked it so much he screenshotted it. So I guess like anything, any <laughs> possible program, like I remember also drawing in Google Docs. <laughs> Um, so I don't know, I just like anytime there was a possibility for drawing digitally, I took it. But yeah, this Godzilla meets mozzarella picture was really early Photoshop. <laughs> and manga was a really big influence and continues to be today. When did you discover manga? Absolutely. Again, I'm like kind of hazy about when I discovered it, but I think it was when I was 10 or 11 years old and I was obsessed. Like I started with Inuyasha. I don't know how I got there, but then I was begging my mom, like, please let's rent some Inuyasha DVDs from the library for our road trip. And my mom got Naruto instead. <laughs> That's how I got on board Naruto. It's my mom's fault, basically. <laughs> and this is all the manga I own, actually. It's not that much, but these are all from childhood and middle school and stuff like that. But manga has been such a huge influence as to how I draw. Like, I started out with fan art, as you can see here, like Inuyasha and this anime girl. I don't know. But if you keep going on, yeah, like, I think that these poses are pretty complex, right, for an elementary schooler or a middle schooler to draw. And it was because of manga, because I was like, I want to be a manga artist. I have to draw backgrounds. I have to draw poses. I have to draw different people. So it really set a foundation for drawing when I was little. And you also were inspired by lots of fairy tales and all sorts of other artists like Arthur Rackham. How did you discover those artists? So when I was little, I was never really inspired by artists, surprisingly, because I was thinking about it. I was like, I was never like, never looking up to any one artist but I was always surrounded by stories. And that makes a lot of sense for my artistic practice today. Like I love creating stories because I grew up on stories. So I read all, a lot of books because my parents encouraged me <laughs> and uh, they bought Hans, and Hans, Anderson, Chris, Hans Christian Andersen fairy tales and Grimm's fairy tales when I was little. So I was really obsessed with those. And only later did I realize that Arthur Rackham illustrated those books. Like I didn't care about Arthur Rackham. I only cared about the stories. <laughs> but yeah, not only books, but also animated films like the early Chinese animation for Monkey King, Song Wukong. I loved those three films. There were three of them. And I love them so much that I got my friends to come over to my house to watch them, but they didn't understand like Chinese. 
Like I had my little Indian friends come over and be like, hey, let's watch. I'll translate. And we're going to love this film because I love it so much. There were no subtitles? No subtitles. No, they're very old films. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I love it. And so many Miyazaki films yeah. were influential to you. And how, how is this different than maybe the manga and the storybooks? Well, they were moving. And also I felt that they were giving more of an experience experience. So I didn't have to like, this sounds kind of sad, but I don't have to imagine that much on my own. <laughs> Whereas when there's a story that I'm reading, I get to sort of visualize it in my own head or make drawings based on them. But when it comes to an animated film, then I could actually see other artists at work, like other artwork. And that was influential because I really looked up to artists in animation, not necessarily anywhere else. So again, I don't know singular names. It's because I loved film so much and so many people worked on those films. <laughs> and you also started doing cartoons fairly early, right? Like this is this I, one that you started in middle school. It's this like epic <laughs> comic book. I mean, this is basically your graphic novel. Yeah, so that's actually a Google Doc drawing. <laughs> this one? Okay. No, no, the spider on the arm. Yeah. This one, okay. <laughs> yeah. But if you go back to like the chicken one, I always felt like I had a really good sense of humor, but it was hard to translate sometimes. And it came out through comics. And I didn't realize that what I was doing was comics. Like, as you can see here, this is on the back of homework. Um, you can see like the words <laughs> faintly of my homework. But I, I was always drawing on the sides of, my homework or on Google Docs or something like that. And these were comics and I didn't really realize it at the time. Like when I was in elementary school and in middle school and early high school, I documented a lot of my life <laughs> in these journals, like the one you can see here. And they're pretty entertaining in my opinion. <laughs> and actually my brother found one of my journals one time and read it without my permission, which is nasty. Don't read someone's diary without their permission. But my brother liked reading my diary so much that he showed my parents. My parents were like, this is pretty good. Why don't you draw an official version and we'll try to have it printed, published, self-published somewhere. And I ended up doing that later. You guys. Kat sent me a copy of this book. I know you did it in middle school, but I think the drawings are brilliant. <laughs> and the fact that your brother is always sipping from a carton of milk in every single panel is just so hilarious. I mean, I, I really want you to like turn this into something someday because it's just oh my god it's hilarious you should put it on people should like buy it it's like so so funny oh, man. when i look at it now i feel so embarrassed <laughs> of course you do i mean it's from middle school like yeah. who wouldn't feel that way but i mean honestly like i think it's brilliant now what about these nancy farmer books Oh my gosh, Nancy Farmer was my favorite author of all time when I was little. I loved House of the Scorpion. I loved the Sea of Trolls trilogy. Um, this is the this is the Sea of Trolls trilogy that I own. And I actually wanted to show this because this was sort of my early exposure to more quote unquote refined digital art because these are by John Foster. And I didn't realize this until later, but John Foster apparently taught at RISD, but before I entered RISD, so I missed him. Too bad. But um, I was seeing these covers and I was like, these are amazing artworks and seeing other artworks online, such as Charlie Bowater, who was like, when I was little, sort of like a hero of mine. <laughs> and I wanted to paint realistically like them. So I ended up really delving into digital art later. And how about Charlie Bowater? I found Charlie Bowater on DeviantArt because that's where you hang out when you're in middle school online. You just go to DeviantArt <laughs> if you produce work, artwork. And I actually bought this Imagine FX magazine solely because Charlie Bowater had a tutorial within and she did the cover. So Charlie Bowater, if you're watching this, I was a huge fan of yours when I was very little. <laughs> and yeah. this really influenced how I painted because I wanted to paint just like Charlie Bowater. <laughs> And here you are in high school, starting to do digital painting. Now, was this on a tablet and were you using Photoshop? Like what was your equipment at the time? Yeah, I was using a really cheap Hanvon tablet. So it was like a little gray Hanvon tablet and you know, it's 
you, there's no fancy schmancy screen on it or anything. It's very cheap. And I was using Photoshop CS3 at this time. Blue Will Spirit is saying, so cool, quote, I didn't know I was doing comics. It was just her art coming out. Simple Triscoll says, hilarious. Cat's daily life is amazing. I know some people think that you have to have such unusual subject matter, but sometimes daily life can be really inspiring. And Zach is saying, it's so cool to see these little projects because that's what I did when I was in middle school too. I know those little doodles on the side of your homework can turn into something. It's really quite extraordinary. And so what were you doing with the digital painting? Were you just doing it by yourself after school? Did you have an art class? How were you cultivating your development in high school? It was definitely just by myself after school. And I really supported myself by watching online tutorials on how to digital paint and also religiously following Charlie Bowater's method of painting. <laughs> and I also, also saw that fan art usually got more attention online. So here is a Castle in the Sky fan art. And this is a Princess Mononoke fan art that I did maybe around when I was like early high school. Yeah. So where were you posting your artwork? Did you have a portfolio on DeviantArt? Were you talking to other students online? Because what well, I'm scared to ask you how when you were in high school, but I guess the internet was around, but it obviously is not what it is today. But what was the online life like as an artist? Right. I was always on DeviantArt. So I post I had a portfolio on DeviantArt. <laughs> People can probably still find me today. <laughs> Please don't go looking. <laughs> <laughs> well, you just basically but, invited them to. <laughs> but anyways, I also had a Tumblr, and I think these are the two main sites I would frequent, but mostly DeviantArt. And I think this painting really changed the game for digital painting for me. I mean, before I was just doing people, fan art, and stuff like that. I wasn't really that serious. But when I turned 14, my parents got me a fancy tablet, like a Wacom Cintiq, because they saw how much I... I was doing it and they thought this is a worthy investment to to support. So they got me a, a, a Cintiq when I was 14 and I was like, I need to prove to them that their purchase was necessary. And so actually this was a piece I, I did um, when I first got that tablet because I was like, they're not going to be proud of me if I keep doing Princess Mononoke fan art. <laughs> I should probably do something a little bit, I don't know, their taste. So I created this kitchen painting and then I got a daily deviation on DeviantArt for those of you who know what that is. It's like sort of an online award feature, but that's when things really took off for me. And I was like, yeah, I can keep doing this and I don't know, just do, do it well. <laughs> well, how did it quote take off for you? Were you just getting a lot of comments online or what was going on? I was definitely getting more exposure because as a daily deviation, you're featured on the site and then people, you get more traffic on your artwork, basically. And I thought, wow, like I, I can, maybe I can be Charlie Bowater, <laughs> at least my version of Charlie Bowater. And so I started doing digital art in different ways. As you could see previously, I did more cartoons. I did more colorful things. I really tried out different ways to do digital art and also submitting them to competitions. So that kitchen painting earlier was also the winner of like this art competition that reprints the artworks super, super big on doors in the downtown area. And it was cool to see that like <laughs> really blown up version of this painting. I was like, whoa, <laughs> this is crazy. <laughs> So even with all this digital art, where does somebody like Andrew Zorn come into play? I went to an Andrew Zorn exhibition when I was around high school. And I was like, this is amazing. And I also want to do this. <laughs> I mean, when I was in high school, I wasn't really sure what I wanted to do. Um, as long as I could try doing it and do it well, I could pursue it. So I tried oil painting. <laughs> and... That was also like, I, I started when I was young, as you can see here. But when I was in later high school, I had to create an AP portfolio. So advanced placement art portfolio. And my concentration was portraiture. And so around ages 16 to 17, I just focused on oil painting. Now, where were you doing these oil paintings? Because I think your average high school kid, usually number one, never gets to oil paint. And number two, doesn't usually get to work with real live models. And so what was the scenario? 
I would either oil paint in the living room of my parents' home or in the garage. Um, <laughs> you can tell which ones are painted in the living room because the backgrounds are so much nicer. But for the ones painted in the garage, the backgrounds are just like made up or just crap, you know? But as for the live models, they were actually my mother's students because my mother is a teacher and also my friends from high school. And usually when people are asked to sit for a portrait, that's not a normal thing. And of course, they're going to be flattered. And of course, normally, they're going to say yes. <laughs> so that's actually how I tricked, I roped a bunch of people in to sit for me for so long. This is a portrait that I painted in my garage, can you tell? But anyways, <laughs> um, that's how people sat for my portraits is because they were flattered and they wanted a copy of the portrait after I was done with it. And so were you doing art all the time in high school? Or was it just once in a while i was doing it as much as i could i would like to say all the time but you know i had other studies but something that was interesting that i realized after leaving high school and middle school and elementary school even that i never felt adequate or good enough in any one subject but when it came to art i felt like i was good enough um even piano i mean that's honestly a big reason why i quit it was because i was all right, but my brother was clearly much better than me. <laughs> More, okay, I just like, need to put cool. things in perspective for you guys, because when Kat <laughs> says she's, quote, all right, that's relative, you know? <laughs> and Kat came to my house, I have a piano, and she's like, like -da 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 -da, and she's like playing fantasy improv. So like, okay, whatever, Kat, you're like crazy good at piano <laughs> as well. So just want everybody to really understand your your actual level of piano playing. So what about art school? How did you start thinking about that? Who planted that idea or was that your idea? I started thinking about art school when I was 16 because I went to the summer program in CalArts, um, the California Institute of the Arts, which is an animate, well, it's not an animation, it's an art school, but it's really known for its animation. And I went to its animation program and that was actually when I started doing figure drawing. And it really opened my eyes as to how many amazing artists there are out there. Because I've kind of been trapped in my own bubble this whole time. Like, I'm like, Charlie Bowater and digital painting and <laughs> oil painting. Like, I'll be the best of the best. But it's not really that true because there's so much art out there. There's so many kinds of art that I haven't tried yet. And going to CalArts for their summer program opened my eyes to college life at an art school. And that was when I started realizing like, oh, I'm going to graduate high school. So I should probably think about what I should do after high school. And I started looking into art schools around this time. And how did you select the schools that you applied to? Were you, I mean, you eventually you landed at RISD, but was RISD your top choice or did you have other plans in mind? RISD was definitely my top American choice. While I was at CalArts for their summer program, I also realized that um, other schools existed out there in the world. And I really wanted to try out for this French school um, just because I wanted to try. <laughs> but that aside, like the French school itself is a different subject. But for American schools, I mean, this is like weird to say, but I just looked for the top rated art schools because I was really not sure how else to look for the right art school for me. And Rizzi was like top rated. So I was like, okay, I guess I should just go there because online US news says that I should go there. <laughs> but fortunately it worked out for me, but for other people, I advise you to really do more research than just that. Like actually reach out to the students, actually reach out to the teachers in these schools, figure out if this is the right environment for you. It's very different from person to person. And also depending on the department. I mean, if you're in industrial design at one school and industrial design in another school, they could be so different from each other. So yeah, do your research. Now, the thing is you didn't go straight to RISD, you went to France. So tell us about that. Right, I got accepted to RISD, but I deferred for a year. And during that year, I went to France to see if I could shoot my shot and get into that French school, um, which was sort of a shot in the dark because first of all, I did not know French. <laughs> I didn't know French at all. Um, and second of all, I was really not prepared for the kind of school that I was applying to because it was an animation school. And I actually had no 
really any animation experience except for that one summer program in CalArts. I wasn't really preparing for that. I had been oil painting and digital painting that whole time. And it required a very different set of skills that I was not prepared for. So I get to France, I'm 17, I'm alone. <laughs> and I'm really stressed too, because this is a investment in my parents' part. And it was a financial risk as well. And I don't know, as a 17 year old, you're like, oh my God, a whole year, that's, that's forever. <laughs> I'm going to be wasting so much time if I don't, if I don't just grab opportunities <laughs> the second I see them. So anyways, I was studying French for a big part of that year. I was trying to learn the language and basically you have, I had to get the DELF certificate, which is a, the language certificate. <laughs> it's kind of like the TOEFL for English. But I got that certificate and I was so focused on studying French and getting that certificate that I didn't prepare for the actual animation exam that the school had and I did not get into the school and I was devastated. <laughs> and as a 17 year old, when you when that happens, you're like, oh, my gosh, I just like wasted so much time and money on this. Like, what am I going to do? Moses is asking, is the French school Goblin École de Limoges? Sorry for yes. the terrible French. <laughs> no, it's okay. <laughs> it was Goblin, and I really wanted to get into that school. But um, I think ultimately it was good that I went to RISD because I had some great experiences, which we will talk about later. Well, I mean, that was a big leap. Blue Wolf Spirit here says that took so much courage impressed. I mean, I'm sure that must have been a defining moment for you, not getting into the school that you really, really wanted to go to, and then being given these options, like, oh, do I try again? Do I go back? So what decide, What made you decide to go back to RISD and start your degree there? I mean, I think it was just pressure because I wanted to be in a school college environment as soon as possible especially during these early 20s years and also all of my friends who were in college <laughs> but they weren't in art school I had no friends who went to art school they all went to like school for engineering or school for ge geology or something like that and I wanted to also be part of that <laughs> I didn't want to be that outlier who was just like kind of bumming around and not in <laughs> school, you know? It was just pressure. And I mean, ultimately it did work out for me, but you know, I would advise for people like, it's fine. Don't, you don't have to worry about if you're in school or not. You'd like, you don't have to care about what other people say about you because it doesn't matter. And what matters is if you grow as a person, no matter what circumstances you go about doing that with. And I know at the time, not getting into the school was probably immensely stressful, but you gained so much from living in France for that one year, right? Like, what do you think the takeaway was from that year in France? I think the takeaway was that no matter what you do, as long as you apply yourself in some way or form, you're going to get some sort of reward back. And at the time, I didn't realize how valuable of an experience it was. And now that I, after I went to RISD and coming out of it, I realized that, wow, like I have a truly unique experience. Not a lot of people were able, are able to say that they know French or they've been to France and stuff like that. And that has really, I felt like I was set apart because of that. And it's really helped informed, helped inform my view on the world and the way I create art and what I want to do with my life. <laughs> Yeah, Karen is saying a year abroad itself is invaluable. Absolutely. I mean, I always tell people, if you have any chance to go anywhere, just go. <laughs> Unless there's a really compelling reason why you can't go, like maybe you can't afford it. But you learn so much when you travel. And I don't think a lot of students have gone to a foreign country totally on their own the way you did. I think a lot of people will go through a study abroad program or maybe there's an exchange thing or something like that. And so I think what you did was truly different. And at such a young age, I mean, a lot of people don't do it till they're like a junior in college. So I think that's remarkable that you really pulled that off. Simple Triscoll is saying, it's one of those things where quote, failing at something can actually be such a stroke of luck. You learn a language and get a unique experience and then also go to RISD and you get to see how any challenge can be a good experience, whether you reach the intended goal or not. 
Absolutely. All right. So what was RISD like when you first arrived your freshman year? When I first arrived at RISD, I had no friends. I knew no one going into this school. But fortunately, I was placed into a really awesome section. So for those of you who don't know, freshman year at RISD is where they mix everyone together, no matter what major you want to major in ultimately. And it's called foundations year or experimental studies or something like that. And I happen to be placed in a really awesome section of very diverse people. And that's where I made my core friend group. And also, this is a side note, but <laughs> when I was in freshman year, I totally tripped and broke my glasses very badly. <laughs> and that was when I started actually paying attention to like fashion and clothing <laughs> and making myself look presentable. <laughs> Like after I broke my glasses, that was when it happened in freshman year of RISD. So it's been very pivotal <laughs> for me. What do you mean? Like you started dressing badly? I don't get it. No, I started dressing better. <laughs> All right. And you did so many different things. We saw the 3D pieces. We saw the drawings. This is like an experimental group collaboration. A lot of these things you're not really doing anymore. And yet I'm going to hope that you learned a lot in that first year. So what what was the important thing about trying all those different things? I mean, I learned some really good things in freshman year, but I also learned some really bad things as well. I think in the good things category is <laughs> just being able to work and collaborate with the people around you. Because in freshman year at RISD, you're kind of stuck with the same group for an entire semester. And you have to learn how to navigate yourself within this group. Now, it could be social dynamics, but it could also be the way that you interact with artwork that your fellow students have produced. And so being kind of open, learning how to critique was a really big thing. Being open to people's feedbacks and being able to give feedback for other people was a really huge part of freshman year for me. But on the flip side, I was on the bad side, I was too focused on work and it really ruined my health in a lot of ways. I lost a ton of weight in freshman year and it was not, it was not good. Like you could see it in my face that I was not okay. <laughs> and I think that since then I've learned better work habits. And I mean, that's a good takeaway, but I wish I hadn't experienced that in the first place. Right. I mean, I think that's a lesson we're always trying to remind ourselves is, listen, you got to take care of yourself mm -hmm. because you're not going to be able to do anything <laughs> if you're not in good shape. Now, what about this 3D piece? This sort of comes out of nowhere and it's it's very strange and I don't know, it kind of gives me goosebumps, not in a good way, but <laughs> in a good way. <laughs> so when did you make this piece? Is this freshman year? Is this later? This was freshman year, first semester. I, I think something that I did well that I'm going to pat myself on the back on is trying different ways to solve the problem. And in this case, the prompt was camouflage. And I could have drawn something like I'm good at drawing, I'm good at painting. And why not try that? Right. But I thought, huh, like, what if I tried something sculptural? Because, you know, it's freshman year. F it. Like, <laughs> I'm not in illustration just yet. I'm in freshman year. So let's just try everything and anything. And so I thought, huh, wouldn't it be weird if I just like camouflage my nails <laughs> into something else? And I don't know if you guys in the chat can tell which one is the real nail, but you can give it a shot, guess, and I'll tell you what the real answer is later. <laughs> oh my God. I never even thought about that. Actually, that Cara, can really... you tell? Uh, is it the second to top one? Yes, it is. <laughs> Yes. You see, I understand my anatomy cat. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. I guess it's not fair to ask you. <laughs> <laughs> you did do a good job, though. All mm -hmm. right. So then you decided to major in illustration. And what was that like when you entered your major? It was such a relief because I started doing things I actually like doing. So this is not freshman year. This, I mean, sorry, this is freshman year. Um, I'm doing stuff that I'm not really comfortable with. But then in illustration, so sophomore year onwards, I started doing stuff I was more comfortable with, like drawing and painting and storytelling and things with a narrative. Um, a lot of freshman year was conceptual, such as this. <laughs> and yeah, it was cool to experience it, but it was also good to know that that's not my cup of tea. <laughs> And also, you've done some jewelry work on and off. Didn't you take two jewelry classes at RISD? Yeah, I did. And they were really awesome. It was 
the first time I realized I could handle a flame <laughs> and solder stuff and really feel like a metal bender, <laughs> like from the Avatar universe. <laughs> You're just as bad as Jordan. Any opportunity to talk about Avatar. Look, By it's the not way. my fault. Jordan has brainwashed me. I, I, I never watched Avatar that much until Jordan came into the picture. <laughs> By the way, you guys, we really have to highlight this pun from Slepnir who says, Professor Liu nailed it. Nice job. I just love that. Sam Yukta is saying, did you know what you're going to do after you finish art school? Were you worried about it? We'll expand on this later, but not really. I did not really know what I was going to do after art school. And I think that's one of the things that failed me in art school was not really having a sense of direction after all my time there. But that being said, being in art school helped open up a lot of different paths for me, like uh, potential paths. My problem was just I wasn't able to focus on one to follow or one or two to follow. But to a certain degree, I think art school is set up that way. I don't feel that I know anybody who went to art school who really had a strong sense of focus. And while that is not the best thing for professional development, I almost feel like that's really the one time in your life when it's okay to be so scatterbrained. And so part of me understands that, but I also sort of feel like you need that time to just mess around. Okay, and then you had me, <laughs> sophomore year. A lot of these pieces we're looking at are from sophomore drawing one. And then you and I started collaborating on Art Prof. And also you were my TA for one semester as well. So how were the last few years in the illustration department for you? Last few years of the illustration department were really good for me. And I lucked out. Like, I was very lucky in terms of it being a good experience for me. Because how it works is sophomore year, you don't get to choose your teachers. I randomly got Clara Lou <laughs> as a professor. And that really changed the game for me, <laughs> personally. So it's been really, it's been truly a lucky ride. But as I progressed through illustration, I felt like I was a video game character leveling up as each year went by. <laughs> because, you know, I started RISI freshman year knowing no one. I had no friends. I was kind, I was pretty alone. But by the time I finished RISI, I had my groups of friends. I was really involved in, in the school and the student body. Like I was also department representative and I was a, a lot of things. <laughs> I took on a lot of roles that really helped define my RISI experience in an awesome, really good way. I also think the fact that you were an RA and that you were really in the community as a very positive, uh, generous person, I think that that itself is a skill. And I wish that art schools would acknowledge that more because so much of being an artist is not just making the work. People think you can just make the work and be done with it. But actually your relationships that you cultivate with other people can be just as important, if not more, <laughs> than sometimes yeah. the artwork actually. And so I also saw when you were a RISI student that you had a really good group of friends that were very close. You guys all related creatively. Talk about why that was important to you and still continues to be today. Right. I think <laughs> that's going to be important to you, whether you're an artist or not. Like this is my friend, Julie Bimbassett. <laughs> we see her from time to time on Art Prof. Another person we see on Art Prof sometimes is Natalie Lin, who's also a really good friend of mine. And they've really just been my support system whenever I feel down, whenever I needed help during art school. And it was kind of a... I don't know, it's like always a guessing game as to who's going to be your friend. It, your best bet is just being nice to everyone <laughs> and then eventually finding out who is going to really stick with you through the hard times. And very luckily for me, I did find that support system in art school. And they still continue to be a support system. Like they also expose me to a lot of different things. Like Julie has really showed me a lot of podcasts. Like I've never been a big listener of podcasts before, but she started me on that. And I think that's been really informative of my art because whenever I have a specific concept or an idea, sometimes those podcasts can really just slip in and, <laughs> and inform things. But support system, opening your eyes to different things. Friends are great. <laughs> you should make them. <laughs> <laughs> now, you also did 
have more of a focus in your later years at RISD? Because I know initially, because you were wanting to go to Goblin in France, you did have this interest in doing animation for a long time. But then I know that at some point there was a pivot where all of a sudden you got really into comics. So talk about that transition, because I know that wasn't really the easiest transition. Right. I think what cued me off as to why I shouldn't continue animation was because I my work ethic <laughs> and the way I drew didn't really suit animation because animators draw all the time, very frequently, often. And that was also a big reason why I chose illustration over animation at RISD. It was because in illustration, I had more things to discover. And also <laughs> they provided really good foundational drawing skills. Like you can actually go to figure modeling stuff. <laughs> and in illustration, I could still sort of look at animation if I was interested in it. I just didn't happen to be at RISD because I found comics. Now, what really got me into comics was this, was this class that I took. Um, and I wasn't even going to take this class. The reason why I took this class was because I had reached out to an older student and I was like, what should I do in illustration? What should I do that and anything that can help me? Anything. Because I don't know anything at RISD. I'm alone. I don't have friends. And that person said, you should take this comics class because even if you don't like comics, the teacher's really good. And I decided to take it. And you know what? Now comics is all I do. <laughs> <laughs> so again, it wasn't really... A conscious decision. It was because I was talking to people and they were recommending things for me. And I was like, okay, let's follow this advice. Let's see where this leads me. That's one piece of advice I give to students is that when you go to college, don't pick your classes based on the topic, but on the professor. Because you could take a subject that you think is your favorite thing. And if you got a crummy professor, it's going to be terrible. And a good professor can get you excited about anything. And so that's really amazing is that you took this leap of faith on something you didn't have a lot of experience in. And look at what you're doing now, which is comics almost all the time. So let's talk about leaving RISD and graduating. It's a really emotional time for a lot of people because... For a lot of people, it's their first time out of school. What was that transition like? And for you, it's fairly recent. You graduated not this past year. Was it 2018 or 2019? 19. 2019. Okay, so you're a fairly recent grad. And what has that transition been like for you? When I graduated, I was very sad. Yeah, I can't help it. <laughs> because oh, yeah. as I said before, I was sort of like a video game character leveling up as each year went by at RISI. And by the time I left RISD, I felt very secure and solid in my community, in my RISD community. And to leave that community was a really tough thing. I cried a lot of tears. I was very sad. <laughs> Luckily for me, and this isn't the case for everyone, and it's fine if it's not the case, but I did have an internship when I left RISD. And that internship lasted a few months. So that was what I could focus on. I didn't have to think immediately about leaving my friends and uh, the RISD area because this internship was also in Providence, Rhode Island. So I was still close by. So I focused on that for a few months. But after that internship, I made the decision to move back home. And that was also a tough decision <laughs> because I don't know why, but people are always moving moving to New York after graduating art school. I'm like, why are you doing this? Because it's so expensive to do that. And also like you have no solid job prospects. And I was going to move in with two other, two other women <laughs> and we had an apartment down. They signed the lease, but at the very last moment I backed out, which is such a jerk move on my part. <laughs> And I luckily we're still friends because we found a third <laughs> roommate for them, luckily. But I think that was a really good decision on my part because I didn't have a job in New York. Why would I move to New York? So I decided to move back to my parents' place in the meantime. Yeah, the whole move to New York and San Francisco after art school, it's really not necessary. And I'll tell you, I've got some horror stories from students who did that without thinking it through and really had a terrible experience. And honestly, it's so expensive now. 
that really the only people that can afford to do that are people who are independently wealthy or if you already have a job. So this idea of moving to a big city that's so expensive with no job prospects, I think is crazy. So in my opinion, <laughs> you made the right move out of all of this. Now talk to us about this comic because this is sort of your epic piece that you did your senior year. So what led you into this comic? This was the last big comic I made for Mercy, yes. So it was still a student work, but it was really a culmination of everything I learned from <laughs> everywhere at Mercy, not only in terms of making comics and art and my inking technique, but also just also how to interact with people and weave these stories that are very human. Because first of all, I'm not Mexican. I'm not Mexican American. I have no experience. I have no background. In fact, why am I even making this story in the first place? I was really inspired by my roommate who was, who is Mexican American. And all the stories she would tell about her family. And whenever we got together, she would just talk about her culture and her life in San Diego. And I thought, wow, I kind of want to make a comic based on this setting that you that you've experienced. And so I've made my own story with my own separate cast of characters with a different kind of moral and story. But the setting was mostly inspired by my roommate and also other Mexican artists and students around the area. Because when I was making this comic, I was like, I can't just talk to my roommate. Like I need to talk to more Mexican American people. So I found people in my community who I could interview. I reached out to a Latinx literary magazine that was local and interviewed one of their head editors to make this story. And it was, I think, a cum cum cumulative <laughs> point. <laughs> Sorry, I'm talking so much that I can't find my words anymore, but it really was a final point in my comics journey at RISD. It was to make this story that was very essentially human and a good display of my comic prowess. <laughs> well, I think one thing that's really unique about your work is that your stories are really important to you. I almost feel like between the visuals and the stories, the stories are what really get you excited about your work. And that's different than what I've seen in a lot of people who do character design and comics. Like a lot of people tend to be so into the visual and the story sort of like there to satisfy <laughs> the existence of the visuals. But for you, I feel that your stories are so unique and poetic and sometimes strange and surreal. They're, they're really like poems in a way, the way that you've written them. So how do you come up with those stories? Are, are they just out of your head? Do you look for things? How do you do that? Wow, thank you, Clara, first of all. <laughs> but second of all, I think I've just grown up with stories so much that I try to find the magic in everyday life because of the magic in stories. Like I, as I said before, I love Grimm's fairy tales. I love Anderson's fairy tales. And I guess trying to find the fairy tale in everyday life, that's so cheesy. I can't believe I just said that. <laughs> <laughs> hey, if it's true, it's true. <laughs> yeah. But sometimes, I don't know. It, art is really hard to define, as you've said in an earlier stream before. And I do want to try defining that or at least exploring that which is why a lot of my comics are about human experiences and emotions. Co Clara, one time you read my comic and you were like, God, everyone's so emotional. Why? And I was like, emotions are interesting. I don't know what to tell you, Clara. <laughs> but I don't know. When I see something really beautiful, like a gorgeous landscape or a beautiful piece of music, I'm thinking, how can I translate this visually? How can I deliver the same emotions I'm feeling now in a story. So I think that's basically my method in comic work or storytelling. It's just to define things that are undefinable in some way or form, or at least try to. Tell us about this illustration because this actually has a pretty specific backstory. <laughs> this is a, a birthday card. Oh man, I'm forgetting, but it was a card to Julie Van Bassett. And the story behind this is that when she was little, her parents took her to a doctor for, I don't know, auditory reasons for a hearing because they thought she was deaf. 
And the doctor was like, JK, she's not deaf at all. Like, I don't know why you thought that. <laughs> but her parents were so serious and like planning to go to like a school for the for the deaf and stuff like that for her. But I just wanted to illustrate the moment when they found out that she wasn't deaf after all, <laughs> because it seemed like a really important part of Julie's childhood. And I wanted to give her a card that was, you know, it was emotional and touching in some way or form. <laughs> for sure. And I think what I've always appreciated about your illustrations is even though there is that narrative arc, there's so many little details that are hidden in your comics and they, they don't jump out immediately. But when you find them, it's like this little jewel. Like my favorite part of this illustration in terms of details is the feet on the baby in the top. But because that's how babies hold their feet. And I don't think a lot of people take the time to see how wonky babies are <laughs> they're moving like they do all these like weird like we used to call my older daughter we used to call her Kuato from Total Recall because she always like did this weird thing with her arms like she always looked like this weird alien and so I feel like you're so conscious of those little things in real life that a lot of people just pass by and that's what I've always appreciated about your work is that there is this level of sophistication that happens on so many different places. So tell us about this piece. This piece is Changeling. What is the story behind this comic? I actually made this comic originally in sophomore year at RISD. And it was, it was a good story, but unfortunately it didn't really get a good crit because <laughs> this might sound vain, but I think the story was so good <laughs> that... <laughs> That no, that honestly, the teacher and the students didn't really know what to say to me because <laughs> it's a good story. <laughs> but unfortunately, I was on a deadline in sophomore year, so the drawing quality really wasn't that good. And that was always something that bothered me very badly because I was like, this is a good story and it doesn't have the art to show it. So after I graduated, I was like, I'm in a rut and I don't really know what to draw anymore. So I decided to pull up this comic and redo it in a better drawing style. And tell us about your technique, because I'm not so sure that everybody really knows what's involved. Like Karen, I think you totally sum this up perfectly, that your drawings look deceptively simple. They look that way, but there's nothing simple about your drawing process. So can you tell us about you and your inking technique? Because it's really extraordinary. Great. So I ink with a nib pen. Actually, I can show it to you right now. This. <laughs> this is the pen I use. <laughs> and I just dip it into the ink and I draw it. And I have to be really careful. I don't flick ink everywhere. So it's been a journey to be able to have that control over the nib and that's something I like and also really dislike about my artwork I mean I think this is the curse of being an artist you always want to do better than what you did before and now I'm like oh it's simple it's clean <laughs> it's it works but currently I'm in a state where I'm like oh, I just wish I were more spontaneous like I wish I could develop a better technique and so I'm in the process of doing so but anyways I ink traditionally I scan and then I usually color digitally that is my process. And this piece as well is also full out nib pen, correct? Right, this is also traditionally drawn. That's a lot of dots, Kat. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I was like, I'm not sure if I wanna do this again. <laughs> <laughs> and is this also from Changeling, this page? Right, this is also from Changeling. Everything here is done traditionally, even the white lines, which is done with white gouache and a paintbrush. Oh, where's the white gouache? Uh, if you go back, it was in the musical notes. Oh, I didn't even see that. See, this is what I mean, is that like your work really requires a certain amount of curiosity and investigation. And I just feel like a lot of artwork nowadays is not like that. People are so much about like the quick read and get it across really fast. And I don't know, I feel that when I look at your comics, I have to slow down. I have to look carefully. And it's not that I feel that way, it's that the work demands it. And I think that's really unusual. I don't think there's a lot of artwork I see nowadays that's like that. Okay, so you actually got involved with Art Prof 
before you graduated because I roped you in <laughs> to all <laughs> these tutorials, you and Julie, who are just, oh my God, you guys are so hilarious together. And you guys should watch because I believe coming up very soon, Julie and Kat are gonna do a stream about manga and they're super stoked about that. So you guys should not miss that. That's gonna be a really, really fun stream. So what was it like joining Art Prof? Because you didn't join really quickly. You, you sort of eased your way into it in a way. And then when you graduated, I was like, oh, here's my chance. I have to grab Kat before somebody else grabs her. <laughs> so what has it been like being a part of this journey and joining the team officially last year? It's been wonderful. I mean, as you said, I kind of eased into Art Prof. I started off as an intern and then I worked my way up to teaching artists. <laughs> and I think the biggest takeaway from Art Prof for me has been the community, like everyone in the chat, Clara, the TAs, and having, again, that's a, a sort of support system that I have, like being able to talk about art in a space that of people who are in the same wavelength as me. And that's something I'd really thought about after I left high school. I was thinking, why didn't I, why don't I ever remember high school in a good light? Like, why is it never positive? Um, and it's because I think the people around me, nothing wrong with them. It's just that nothing wrong with me either. We weren't on the same wavelength and I couldn't really express myself in high school. Whereas at RISI and in art prof, I can nerd out about art all I want and it's no problem. In fact, it's welcomed. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Rachel is saying, how do you deal with competition at art school? I feel like in a lot of cases, artists are one in a few in their group. And then moving to art school, you start to see such talent. So overwhelming. Absolutely. And to sort of go through my journey of that, when I started in the summer program at CalArts, I felt major competition. It was the first time I'd ever experienced that. I don't think it was necessarily positive for me all the time because it was always a competition of who could be the better drawer. And that's not how I like living my life. <laughs> Whereas when I went to RISD, I mean, there's no, this is not a difference between CalArts and RISD. It's just the people I was surrounded with. I so happened to be surrounded with. At RISD, I felt the same competition. And there were definitely people who were competitive and nasty <laughs> and were really out to get you. But I think the balance here is finding the right group of people for you. Again, it's sort of like a guessing game. Be nice to everyone, but see how they are. And then stick with the ones who you think will stick with you, right? And I found friends who were good at what they did, but didn't use that to put me down. They used it to help me, to uplift me, to buoy, buoy me. <laughs> and I tried to do the same for them. So it was really a symbiotic relationship. And that's what makes or breaks art competition and how it affects you. It is, does this put me down or does this raise me up? And it's all about finding the community that raises you up. Because you know what? There's some toxic people out there and you have to find out ways to stay away from those people and to be with the people that are really going to nourish you. Because, you know, it's tricky to find a group of people who are going to support you, but also not just massage your ego. And I think that that's something we're pretty good at at Art Prof where one of us, usually me, says something really stupid and you guys are like, no, Clara, that's really dumb, <laughs> right? And the fact that you guys can say that to me is really wonderful because I don't wanna be surrounded by people that just approve everything just to approve it. I wanna know, is that actually gonna work or not? And it seems to me, Kat, that you have found people that will tell you, Kat, you're drawing skinny, middle-aged girl, not middle-aged, middle school. <laughs> female characters all the time and not let you get away with something. So I think that that's really hard. Is, and I think that's what I've heard across the board from all art school graduates is the thing they miss the most is the community. And the biggest challenge when you get out of school is finding that place where you can connect with other people and have that exchange. So Kat, what is up next for you? Do you have any larger goals that you're looking at in the future? That's a really good question. And I had official plans, but they fell through because of the pandemic. And I feel because of the pandemic, because of COVID, 
things feel like nothing will ever be finalized. And I think this is a universal feeling. I don't think it's just me. And I'm kind of, I feel like I'm at a standstill because of this pandemic. But originally I was working a nine to five job that I really loved <laughs> and doing art outside of that nine to five job. And I would have liked to continue that. But in the meantime, I think I will just try to keep drawing and working for Art Prof <laughs> and see what opportunities open up. Like, I'm very open to very different things. And I've done a lot of art related things, but that doesn't mean that everyone should. And I want to just reiterate it's very normal for you to come out of school expecting to do one thing, but doing something completely different. That's totally normal. I just happen to be someone who did a lot of art and continued to do so, but it's a case by case basis. Don't beat yourself over it. Absolutely. And it's okay to repivot and do something that you were not anticipating. I mean, I was not anticipating art prof 20 years ago. I mean, I wanted to be the New York City Chelsea art gallery person and that clearly did not happen. But you know what, I'm glad. There's so many cool things that have happened as a result of that. So we're excited to see where you go with that, Kat, because you know, you're kind of awesome, so. <laughs> <laughs> um, really fast, just because Blue Wolf Spirit has asked, but in the Changeling comic, yes, the notes can be played. They play um, Stairway to Heaven by Led Zeppelin. <laughs> Why Stairway to Heaven? I love that song for some reason. I just think the lyrics are magical, and I love the imagery of stairs going up to the sky. It's something I've used not only in Changeling, but also in Mama Bruja. So again, I just kind of pull things from everywhere <laughs> and try to put them into my comics. So Stairway to Heaven is something I think will just keep reoccurring in my life. I don't know, maybe. <laughs> Our Prof has a podcast. It's available on Spotify and also on iTunes. Kat and I will be hanging out in the post live streams channel in the Art Prof Discord. Please join us. The invite link is in the video description below. Subscribe to our channel and join the Art Prof family. And thank you so much to our top Patreon supporters for keeping everything up and running. Thank you to everybody for all your great comments, your questions, adding to the discussion, and of course, to our fabulous teaching artist here, Kat, for dishing on her artistic life. Everybody, thank you so much. We'll see you next time. Bye-bye.